me and ask. This is uh, important because I have some, uh, quite some slides to show you today. Okay, let's get started. Uh, my name is Frank Karliczek. I think uh, most of you know me already. I'm a KDE contributor and developer for nearly 10 years now. And I'm also running the Open Desktop Org um, websites, which are community websites for themes and applications. Um, topic of today is KDE versus the cloud. <laughs> this is, with cloud, I mean uh, web-based applications and um, internet storage and collaboration solutions. Okay. Um, the state of KDE. Um, the 4.4 release we will have in, I think, uh, two or three weeks now. It's a really fantastic release, I think. It's, uh, it's powerful, it's beautiful, it's fast, it's secure, it's a great, great desktop. Um, but today I want to talk a little bit more about the next five years. Next five to ten years, I think they will change the, the landscape of, um, of desktop computing. So one of the biggest moves we saw in the last few uh, months and years is the move from uh, desktop application to cloud applications. Um, perhaps some of you would say, well, I don't agree. I still use my desktop applications, and, uh, but I want to give you some examples. Um, first, um, music. Um, Pandora and Last.fm are solutions where you can listen to your music online in the browser. And people, if you talk to teenagers nowadays, they don't care anymore if the MP3 file is on their computer or not. It's just they go to a website, they click on play, minimize the window, and that's the radio. So um, desktop media players are still important for people who love mu music and have lots of music on their, on their disk. But for most people nowadays, it's not important anymore if it's a cloud application or a desktop application. Next example is Google Docs. Um, I mean, um, we are doing an office suite, all right? We are doing K Office, and we have other editors and note-taking applications. And still, I saw um, in a lot of developer sprints and developer meeting of KDE developers that I use Google Docs. I mean, it's really interesting. We are not eating our own dog food here. Then we have all this, uh, this topic with emails. I mean, with Gmail and Hotmail and solutions like that, people more and more use web-based emails and no desktop mail client anymore. And even messaging in social networks. I mean, there are open source people that refuse to answer my emails. Instead, they're sending me messages via Facebook. So this is really, <laughs> this is really, really interesting. The next is Flickr, Picasa. Um, people don't manage their photos on their desktop anymore. They upload it to a, to a photo sharing site, do red eye correction and all of the stuff, tagging and, and sharing with it, and don't use it, use it on the desktop anymore. And even instant messaging, which is interesting to me, because this is, for me, this is clearly a use case for, for a desktop application. But nowadays, all, I saw this yesterday here in this room from somebody, just using a web-based messaging. Okay, these are two charts from, um, from Google and from a, from a recruiting company about uh, jobs and uh, trends about cloud computing. So this is really a huge trend. It's, um, it's exploding the last few years and months and this is an, in, an important trend in IT. Then we have Chrome OS. I think most of you heard of it, but we want to show you some, some details you probably don't know yet. Um, it's a bootable, bootable browser, basically. You just um, start your, your computer, in a few seconds it's online, you have a browser. And you don't have a taskbar anymore. Instead of, you have the tabs of the browser. And you don't have an application start menu. Instead, you have bookmarks. And it's basically all you need. Here in the corner, you have some, the clock and some Wi-Fi settings, and that's all. They even improved um, the HTML uh, specification a bit that you can have notifications here. Here's a Gmail tab. And you can see that you, that you have two unread messages here. So it's a, a website can push notifications to the desktop. 
and they have this special extension here where we have some kind of chat area. So a website can open up a chat window on your desktop even if you're surfing on a different website at the moment. So you would say, well, this is so limited. I will never use this. Um, for example, offline. What about offline? They have integrated um, Google Gears and with HTML5, they have complete offline support. So you can edit your documents offline and if you're online again, it syncs again to, to the cloud. Then native code support. You would say, well, we will never use this for something like, I don't know, a video encoder or a really complex application. But there's an extension where you can download native code via the website and ex execute it locally on your machine. Next thing is notifications. I already um, um, explained it to you in the, next, in the last slide that you have actually notifications even if it's a website. OpenGL, what about games? There's no OpenGL support in the web. And um, security. I mean, in Chrome OS, they have this special functionality where you, um, if you manage to modify your local operating system in some way, it will automatically download the, the binary again and replace it. So it's impossible to have local modifications. And they say this is some kind of security, but it's of course, they force you to have everything in the cloud. So Google doesn't think that native desktop applications are less important in the future. They are think that they are ir irrelevant. They could add support for local applications, but they don't do it. They think this is just not important. Okay, why this trend? Um, how does it come that everything moves away from desktop applications nowadays? I did a survey on, the, on my blog, um, but uh, before I can show, the, show you the results, I want to ask in the room about opinions of with you. Why do you think are cloud applications very attractive nowadays? What are the reasons? Well, for me, especially because um, I use various machines. So if I have everything stored online or somewhere on the server, I don't have to bother about having the right machine. Okay. So it's sharing or accessing your data from different machines. Yes. Okay. Other opinions? Uh, secure data is like I don't trust myself to keep on my photos. Yeah. So it's automatically backup. You don't have to worry about backing your data. Yeah. And uh, collaboration. Collaboration here. Yeah. Deployment. Sorry. Deployment. Deployment. Yeah. Sharing, yeah. These are basically the, the answers everybody gives. So um, first, this is the accessing of data um, and applications from every machine. Another answer was easy to interact with other users. Then we have um, data can access from everywhere, my PC, my laptop, girlfriend's laptop, doesn't matter, internet cafe, it's just everything is accessible. You don't have to worry about losing your work. And you can delegate upgrades, up, um, backups to your service provider. So that's basically your answers. This is the stuff everybody answers. So um, yeah, you don't need to install software. So deployment is really not an issue. OK, so shiny, happy new world is coming, right? So lots of, lots of problems are solved. So this is really a bright future. <coughs> Um, so is this trend good from a free software perspective? I mean, why not? Everything is GPL, right? Chrome OS is GPL, Chrome is GPL, Android is GPL, great. Richard Stallman would say, great, we, this is victory. What is it connecting to? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, where's the place for a classic desktop application like, um, like we do with KDE in the future, in the next 10 years? Is it still needed? Or do we just do a browse and that's all? So, um, of course, there are also disadvantages. And I also did a survey about disadvantages. And I was, uh, want to ask you again, what do you think are disadvantages of cloud-based computing? Chani? Well, if, unless you have that Chrome OS for the offline storage, you goes in here and access it and it's done. <laughs> so only accessible if you're online? What do you, do it? Yeah. 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 
Privacy. Privacy, yeah. Yeah. You trust them with your backups and then they lose them. Yeah. Uh, some, sometimes the web interfaces are crap. Yeah. <laughs> what do you mean is crap not powerful enough or? Yeah. <laughs> I'd like to see more uh, cloud applications be pulled out of the cloud and connected, you know, to the, you know, mm -hmm. with KE or something. So you could have the Facebook app or whatever. Yeah. I saw a case of someone being labeled as a spam and their account was frozen, they lost everything. Yeah. Like yeah, true. You get, you get all these disconnected. <laughs> you get all these disconnected networks. Like for example, you have a bunch of friends on Facebook, and then you have to go to LinkedIn, and you have to, you know, get in contact with them yes. again and get their address again. Yeah. You can't get your contacts out of Facebook and import them in LinkedIn or. Yeah. Now get well, you can, but then you have to give them the passwords for everything else, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. It's, it's and and besides, they might even you know pick you out of Facebook because you were stupid enough to download the email addresses of all your old friends. Apparently, that kind of stuff uh, isn't allowed. Yeah. <laughs> okay, last one. <laughs> Wasting your time, wasting everyone else's time. <laughs> but also, when people send the information somehow, they're leaking and there's basic information about you, even if you don't want to take part in this game. Yeah, I'm sick of being invited to Farmville, I don't want to take part in this game. Okay. Okay. So from <coughs> Sorry, from a yeah. developer perspective also, I, I, I'm no expert, but HTML and JavaScript and stuff might not always be very... It's limiting, yeah. yeah convenient to use or sometimes it seems like it's painful. Pulled for, <laughs> for things that it's not made for. Exactly, yeah. We were talking about this last night too, and I was mentioned earlier about backups. It's your data, but because it's in the cloud, we become lazy <coughs> or we don't know how, so we don't back up our yeah. data yeah, we, locally and because we think we trust that it's all yeah. there. We rely on the on the, on the services of another another party and it's not clear if it's will work all the time or not. Okay, that's basically also the, the answers post, uh, most of the people give. Security is the most important thing. So you don't have control over your data anymore. Especially if, you, if it's hosted in a different country. For example, in Europe, we have very strict uh, data protection rules, but most of the cloud applications that run in the United States. So this is really, they could sell the data or do whatever with it, or just say, well, now it's, you have to pay for it, and it's just not, not under your control. Then um, user data might not be encrypted. We have security problems, so perhaps my data is stolen by somebody because the application is not secure. And um, we depend on third-party infrastructure, like you said. And if, as a developer, um, HTML is limited, and also um, hosting is highly not trivial. I mean, this is just writing a, a, a nice little KDE application and put it on the web and share it is easy. But running your own server all the time is really uh, not a problem for Google but a problem for, for developers, probably. Okay. I would dispute that one. I mean, look at, look at all the Facebook apps. Yeah. All those Facebook apps, they're all running on some server and sending snippets of the uh, markup to Facebook. And all of these Facebook apps, they're, they're, they're um, developers and they're probably fine hosting and running some Facebook server. So you need to that one. Well, I mean, uh, Facebook application is a good example because they run on your own server, right? They communicate with Facebook. They're not running on the Facebook servers. Yeah, so you have to make sure that your server is running 24 hours and it's secure and it's also fast enough. And they do this because there's some kind of business model behind this, because it's selling advertising, or, I don't know. Well, but it's a related thing there. You can't patch Gmail. If you want a new feature in Gmail and the Gmail yeah. developers don't feel like it, that's it. True. Never get yeah, true. We are always Yes. Yeah. Okay, just to give you an, an, an overview now about the stuff uh, which is Google doing at the moment. I think parts of the stuff you know already, but there's really so much behind all this. First of all, it's of course um, they do search. Everybody knows this. It's also one of the biggest email providers in the world with Gmail. They have group support. They have YouTube, the biggest uh, video site in the world. They have calendar application. They have Wave. They have an Android. This is 
a complete operating system for mobile devices. They have a desktop operating system now, Chrome OS. They have an, an own DNS server. They are the biggest advertising company in the world. They have um, Office solution, Google Docs. They have a mapping application. They have their own browser. They have Google Talk. They have Google Apps for companies. They have a voice solution only in the US. But still, they have Google Earth. They have their own file storage solution announced, I think, three days ago. They have um, Google Health, which is very scary to me, that you can upload your own your medical record to, to Google. Uh, <laughs> this is just interesting. Yeah. <laughs> they have Blogger, one of the biggest blogging platforms. Picasa, they have Google Reader, they have Orkut social networking, they have iGoogle, they have Latitude, uh, um, location-based solution. They have their own fiber. They have their own dark fiber. I think, um, Jeff, Jeff, what percentage of the internet traffic is going through, um, through about uh, through? Yeah. So they're basically running the internet in a few years. So this. Yeah. 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 They're building their own power plant at the moment. <laughs> yeah. They have a mobile devices that sell hardware now with, uh, with the Nexus One. They have, and they're also going to sell their own netbooks in the future. A little anecdote, I was sitting with uh, an Android person the other day, and they were asking me what we do, and I said, well, we do software development, but we don't do internet. Yeah. And he said, well, we do the internet. <laughs> <laughs> and I think they asked what you mean that. They think that they are developing the internet. Yeah. In yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I mean, quite some people think that this is probably too much. I mean, this is too much power in the cloud and at it at one single company. So, what can we do? About yeah. Sorry. They're not evil. They're, yeah, they're not evil. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I think there were. Yeah, but there are people who think that this could be a publicity stunt. No, they've been they've been pretty yeah, they, yeah. that stuff for years yeah. now. Okay. What can we do about this? I mean, we can't obviously, as a as a KDE community, do nothing against uh, Google. But the question is, what is what what do we do in a few years? What is the what do we do as our, our product? What kind of software do we do to, to, to reach which goal? I mean, this is just, we have to position ourselves in this new world. Um, and for me, the question is, if it's, isn't it possible to combine, to combine best of both worlds? This means we have, this, we have these rich desktop applications, right? Like somebody said, um, web applications with HTML are sometimes crippled. I mean, they are, they are nice in some way and they are accessible and everything, but they are limited. I mean, you, if you compare something, the feature set of Amarok, for example, with an online music player, this is no, or even K Office. I mean, K Office has so many features, which is not possible in the web at, at the moment. And you see this with all kinds of applications. So our rich desktop applications are far more powerful and better than, um, than web-based applications. But web um, applications also have some benefits. So there of course, the social aspect. Sorry? So um, one thing that you may not know is they, they announced that the Chrome OS to get around those problems is they're going to have a native client, which yeah. is similar in some ways. To, it basically allows you to write code on the machine. Yes. So they're going to try to get around you know, any problems with computing stuff on web apps by having Local yeah, true. Yes, yes. Um, okay, I think we can combine best of both worlds, like I said. We can use our existing rich desktop applications instead of web applications because they're far more powerful, written with Qt, written on top of KDE, and also have some social features, has um, and this application is easy deployable and have a solution for managing the data. This means 
some kind of cloud storage, but my own cloud storage, not a Google storage, my personal one, that I am in control and I can decide who is doing what. And I think if we combine these four things, we have something which is better than, than the standard cloud applications from Google. Yeah, I can add on to that from a PIM perspective. You, yeah. of course, are aware of this because uh, <coughs> Gmail obviously is trying to you know, dominate all of our space there, but, and Google or Canada, whatever. One thing that we think is very, very important is that the rich client can be a, like an aggregation point that is under your control, and it can also be a point of policy. Yes. So you decide yeah, very good. Yeah. what and how and when and how much of your data yeah. from all of these different sources you decide. to the desktop and then back to the cloud. Yes. So the policy thing to us is very important. Alexandra? Yeah, I have a remark uh, on that part, uh, or the, the, the data under my control. Yeah. That would mean that if I want to have it stored on a server somewhere, and I have to control it myself, I mean... Mm -hmm. I will come back to this. Yeah, yeah, I come back to this later. Okay. I don't mean, um, Celeste. I don't know if you're going to talk about this in the next few slides, but uh, are you going to comment about Canonical's Ubuntu 1? Um, I can give some comments about this now. I don't have it on the slide. I can just ask at the end. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Mm -hmm. Ubuntu 1 is an interesting solution, uh, an interesting product. Uh, most of you know it already, I, I think. I think yeah, <laughs> it's, a, it's a solution to store at the moment. They will extend this in the future, but at the moment it's a solution to, to store your data in the cloud and access it from different devices. But the thing is that this is, um, this is not open, this is not free. This is a just, like I, I think, I say most of the time that the best about, open, uh, about Ubuntu One is the name Ubuntu. I mean, otherwise it's just the same as Dropbox or Google Files. It's a closed solution. It's not under your control. You have to pay for it. And it's, I mean, it's an interesting business plan for, for Canonical, but it's not, not something I would like to have. You might, you might talk about this, but since you just mentioned it, you said that, you know, when down to the point, you have to pay for it. But is there going to be any, any sort of free software, open source solution to the cloud? that is free and doesn't require you to have a server and set up all these other mm. things? Is, is that possible? I'll come back to this later. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, one other um, anecdote here, um, the iPhone. I mean, uh, at the first year of the iPhone, Apple said that we don't allow native applications, we just allow web applications. So you have a great browser, you can hide your menu bar and everything, and run your great um, web applications inside the phone. And the theory was that this is enough. But then they opened up the platform, and now we have over 100,000 applications. Most of them are basically just a client application accessing some web services in the cloud. So this is basically the same. This is just a rich application using um, cloud backend services. So this somehow proves that this is an interesting model for, for users. This is more powerful than just some, some website. Okay, so what do we have to do? Um, I think we have to work on the social side of KDE. We have to work on the deployment, access to application side, and we have to work on the access and sharing of data side. If we, if we solve these three points, we are really a great competitor to web applications, to cloud applications, and we are even better because we have this native power. And I want to talk about these three points now in the rest of the presentation. Okay, first, social. Um, you know the social desktop idea? The idea is to bring uh, social features who are successful in the web to desktop applications. Um, something like finding other people with the same interests, um, becoming friends with people, joining groups, some kind of sub-communities, do messaging between users, um, reading news feeds, what's going on in my, in my world, knowledge base, uh, knowledge sharing in different ways, and um, events. These are just some, some examples. We, we can extend this. And this all all this stuff is successful in the web at the moment. 
but we can bring this to the to the desktop applications. And like um, you probably know, we had some proof of concept with the 4.3 release in summer, but now with the upcoming 4.4, we really did great progress. I want to show you some some details which are not, I'm not a big blogger, so most of the stuff is probably not known at the moment, but I want to show you some, some details. First of all, we have Attica. Attica is a library, originally developed by Cornelius, and then later by, um, by Sebas and by Frederick, which, is, um, which handles all the protocol stuff. So this is, handles all the, the, the REST API stuff to connect this to cloud services. And also handles all the authentication, <laughs> so you don't have to. You don't have to. Everything okay? Okay. So you don't have to handle, um, carry, care about um, user accounts and passwords and all this stuff. This is all done by the by the library. Um, it also provides error handling, so you don't have to take care if you're offline. What happens if you're offline or something like that? Um, it handles different data providers because this concept here, it, um, it's not about connecting to one web service, but to connecting to different web services. And you're in control, you can decide which data comes in, what you do with it. And um, this all enables a transparent access for all applications. So if you're in some application, you want to search for a user in the region or send a message or create an event or look, for, look up some, some data in some repository or whatever, you can just call the functionality provided by this, by this library and you're done. You don't have to care about all this protocol and backend stuff. And this is written with in, in Qt only. So it's a Qt only application, but we have an optional KDE plugin. This means we have integration is, is KWallet and other services, Kioslave if you want, but if you don't want, just use the Qt only version. Um, then we have this new um, system settings, settings page, where you can manage all your different providers. So you can say, well, with KDE we have, for example, the open desktop network, then we have the forums, then we have some other stuff pre-configured. But you can say, well, I want to remove one of them because I don't like it. And you can add your own one or your company one or whatever, and you can manage your different data sources. And you can register in your, your new account and manage all your login information inside this system setting. So the different applications don't have to care about the details. So it's just handled transparently. The next big thing is complete uh, friends management. Beside the functionality where you can um, search for other users nearby, you can also edit and um, configure all your, your friends network. You can invite people, you can um, confirm them, you can decline them, cancel the friendship again, everything without a browser. So this is everything done with the API, with Attica, and in this case with the Plasmoid. But you can add this to any application you want. So it's very easy. Then we have messages, of course. You can send messages to, to people. Perhaps you can see, well, there's a KDE event in my town. I want to see who is going there. Well, there's another user. Let's send a message if you can meet to discuss some whatever. So this is everything is possible without, without opening a browser. Then we have this new uh, knowledge base plasmoid. Marco did mainly. <laughs> this is a great way to access um, knowledge base information directly from inside applications. So everything also with different backends, with, with Libatica and with different frontends. So my dream is that applications in the future that provide a way to um, just type in a question and get an answer, but not with the built-in handbook, but just online, just in a collaborative way together, the community together helps other users to find answers. So this is way better than the static handbook, I think. Then the next new plasmoid is um, the activities newsfeed plasmoid. The idea is to put this in the, in the panel here and it pops up if an event happens. So for example, um, one of your favorite applications has a new version. So you can, well, there's a new version of, I don't know, Amarok. Click on it and see what's new and just use it. Or you got a message from somebody or there's a new KDE Linux event in your town or there's an answer to one of your open questions in the knowledge base or whatever. So this is just to notify users about events. 
And this is the f um, most favorite feature of me. This is our custom attributes. We added custom attributes to the API, to, to Attica, and to the backend. So every application can store random key value pairs at the users. And you can search for them and um, find other users. So use cases are, for example, Parley. Um, it's already partly implemented that you can open up Parley. You know, you know Parley probably. It's an um, application to, to learn other languages. And you see automatically people who, are, who speak the language you are, want to learn at the moment and want to learn the, the, the language uh, you speak. So and all this information is, is um, stored in the custom attributes. So every application can do this. Just store whatever you want. For example, MR could store um, your personal music taste, and you can automatically find other people with the same taste. Or games can, can store something like, um, I like to play chess together with somebody, and then um, you can search for other users who also uh, want to play chess, and you can connect them together. OK. So something about, yeah? I'm sorry, it just seemed appropriate like, right here before you move on. Yeah. Um, how does the connecting work? Like, um, like there's got to be like, something in the cloud, right, to connect yes. me and Leo if you want to play chess. Yeah, true. Um, sorry, I forgot, I forgot this aspect. Uh, we have this concept of different data providers. So we have different web services, and they can provide different functionalities. For example, in this case, we have a module called People. It implements some basic functionalities like create a new account, edit account, search for people, edit attributes, um, whatever. And there, uh, there are different providers providing this functionality. And Artica just calls the different providers, aggregates the data, and gives it back to the, to the application. So this is not a login to some website, even if I'm running um, the open desktop websites. This is completely, completely open. So in the future, um, I think the integration with application is now very easy. So with, uh, with the 4.5 release cycle, I think we really should um, integrate more applications with this functionality. We're doing a social desktop developer sprint the next two months. So everybody's invited, of course, who is interested. Um, we have memo.org and forumkde.org as data providers already. So there are three data providers um, which provide certain functionalities and they're aggregated and accessible to the applications. And hopefully we have more providers in the future. Um, the communication to the, to the providers is um, done with the Open Collaboration Services API, which is a free specification done um, hosted on freedesktop.org. Um, and the original idea for me was that it's, it's REST-based and it's really easy to understand, easy to implement, and that hopefully a lot of providers implement this and we can all connect to each other. But it's, it still seems to be a little bit of difficult. So there are, at the moment, these three providers, but not more. So um, today I will um, um, release a um, server implementation um, under the HEPL license which is just a, the, the API backend. It's written in PHP. And it's, I think it's, um, it's quite easy to understand. And it has some hooks in it, which you can connect to your uh, existing service. So for example, um, a forum can um, feed in some knowledge base data, or um, I don't know, some Debian repository can fit in some um, application data or whatever. It's just a, an easy way to connect existing web services together with the system. And we also have, of course, the client side implementation, which is Attica. It's a um, Qt implementation, like I said. And uh, we also have a PHP implementation in the future. I'm doing this at the moment for the new KDE.org website. So it's also a free um, implementation of the, of the client side of this API. So I really think that we have some great social features, and this will be um, adopted by a lot of more backends and frontends in the future, because now everything is there. just have to use it. OK, now to the second topic, which is deployable and access to applications. Um, now I want to show you a few features about the Get Hot New Stuff we are doing. Get Hot New Stuff is a functionality, a framework, 
to access um, application and scripts from everywhere in a community, um, in a shared way. We have Get, um, Get Hot New Stuff version 1 in KDE 3 series. We have the Get Hot New Stuff version 2 in the KDE 4 series. And now with KDE um, Software um, um, Collection 4.4, I forgot the SC, of course. <laughs> we have the completely new Get Hot New Stuff 3 version, which is a huge improvement. We implemented, I think, all of the feature requests from the last years. And um, the most important ones are, of course, uh, full search. So we can, can search now for, for data and for application, and the search is done by the, on the server side now. So in the, in the past, you only had uh, limited um, access to wallpapers or whatever applications and scripts, but now it's done on the server. And we have screenshots, of course, small screenshots and big screenshots of the stuff. Then we have long descriptions. You can read what this is all about, if I want to try it or not. And we have updating support. So if a new version of a wallpaper or some plugin or some document or whatever is available, you get a notification, you can update it or not. This is now possible. We have uh, voting support. You can directly vote from inside the Get Hot New Stuff dialog. You don't have to go to the website at all. And you can become a fan of some entry and get some uh, notification, like I said, you, uh, to, um, I showed you earlier, um, about new stuff is going on with my favorite stuff. Um, this is a detailed dialog. <laughs> Sorry for the stupid image. <laughs> Um, it's, uh, it shows the, um, an entry about, uh, it's, a, it's a comic provider for, for the comic plasmoids. We have, I don't know, 120 comic providers at the moment. It's really huge, not comics, but different sources for comics. And you can see a preview, can read a description, go to website, see which user uploads, has uploaded that, can vote it, can become a fan, whatever, everything without a website. So this is now available. Another important feature is now uploading is also possible. We have this new upload dialog, which is, um, can be called um, independently from the command line, but also integrated in some um, application, of course. Parley already implemented this, so you can directly um, edit your data, whatever it is, and just press upload and share it with the world. So this is also now, this is also implemented. So we have um, in-app downloads, like I said, to download some extensions or add-on data or whatever. And we also support, of course, application downloads. We have integration with the OpenSUSE build service now. So um, you can upload your, um, your, your Taufall or your source code or whatever to the build service and connect the build service ID to the to the open desktop backend, for example, and you get directly all the available binary files directly pushed to your, through Get Hot New Stuff to your desktop. We have integration with Qt Creator. So um, this is just a plugin at the moment, but um, um, hopefully this will be merged into the main line where you can directly from Creator say, well, I want to, now this application is done, I want to publish this and will be directly uploaded and made uh, it's available to the world. Hopefully, um, also integrated with the, with the build service. I think uh, our friends in Nuremberg are lacking a little bit behind there, <laughs> but this is the idea. That's <laughs> right. Yeah, that's the idea. Um, yeah. Just uh, too many fingers and too many pies. <laughs> yeah, I mean the idea is. Dead, Sorry. They are playing dead. They're playing dead. You can hit him now. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the idea is that you, you write your application in Creator. If it's done, you press a button. It will be uploaded to the build service. It will automatically be built for all available distributions. Hopefully uh, Windows and Mac also in the future. And directly... Um, Pushed it to push it to um, to the open desktop repository, so people can download all the, um, the available binaries without caring about you know, is this really the right version or is this really uh, has somebody compiled this already for my special uh, distribution? So this is really a complete solution. 
with integration with Identica, Twitter, and Facebook here. So all the new applications are announced on the social networks. You get notification if a new stuff is available, of course. Security is an important aspect. I want to do a BOF session here at, um, in San Diego this week to discuss this because this could be an issue if someone uploads an insecure source code, whatever, to the build service and with some Trojan interface or whatever. So this is something we have to, we have to discuss. And in the future, my idea is to have something like web links. I mean, with cloud applications, you have just a link. You can click on a link and you, you go to the website and you can use everything. So it would be nice to have also some, some link which you can click, send to a friend, share whatever, and you get an, 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 a nice get hot new stuff interface where you see, well, here's this new application. Somebody wants to share this plasmoid or this extension or whatever with it. Just use it or not and make deployment really easy. We even have integrated payment support. So you can, for example, say, well, I want to share this with somebody, but I want to have 50 cent for this, um, for this um, plugin, for this wallpaper or whatever. And we can also very easily integrate, for example, ebooks into Ocular if you want, integrate an, an ebook store or MP3 buying from Amazon into Amazon or whatever. So this is, if somebody wants to use this, this is already, already there. And like I said earlier, the server side implementation, I make this available now also. So it's really easy to, to provide a backend for this. If you have some repository of some stuff or whatever, I want to make this easily available to KDE Desktop, just use this existing library and, and, and hook this together and, and yeah, you're done. Um, yeah, like I said, everybody's welcome to integrate existing repositories. Okay, hopefully this makes access to application very easy in the future. This is early stage at the moment, there's still stuff to do. But I think if we work more on this front, we can really make access to applications easy. Okay, this last point was access and sharing of data. I think this is a very, very important point for me because I'm really, I'm really not satisfied with the current solution. I really think it sucks. I mean, I have all my documents at my desktop at home at the moment, somewhere in my home directory, right? But now I'm in San Francisco with my notebook. So how do I access my data? Sometimes I co copy stuff around. Sometimes I hope that I have internet access and I can, can mount it uh, somehow because I know how SSH works. And it's not versioned, it's not backup. It's, it's really the same situation as 20 years ago. And um, we did some brainstorming together with some friends from KDE and this took several months. And I have a wish list now from stuff I want to have for storing my data. The first wish is all data under my control. I don't want to use something like Dropbox or whatever. I want to be in, I want to be in control but my data. This is very important to me, the most important thing. Um, but I still want to access everything from every device. I want to access all my data, uh, data from my home desktop, of course. Also want to access it from, uh, from my work desktop, which probably doesn't run KDE, just Linux or Windows or um, a Mac or whatever. Um, I also want to access it from my laptop. This means in an offline way. Then from my netbook, which is, has limited storage, for example. From a random internet cafe, I want to access all my data. And also from my smartphone, of course. No. <laughs> I want more. <laughs> yeah. Also online and offline support, very important, I think. Sometimes I don't have a fast internet connection to my, to my personal cloud or whatever, and I want to synchronize this somehow. Just if I'm online, again, sync my data, and if I'm offline, I can work on my local version. Then automatically backup. I mean, I have my own script for years now with an, just an improved R sync, basically. But uh, my normal users that don't back up at all. It would be nice if this storage solution could back up the data automatically somehow. And versioning, of course, I mean, this is really crazy. I mean, there are companies who are selling um, servers like, like Novell, <laughs> for example, or even uh, Microsoft, and they don't even have proper versioning support in it. 
So I can't go back to the last, word, last week's version of my open office document, for example. I want to, want to have versioning support. Encryption, of course. Easy sharing is probably one of the most important things. I want to click on one of my files and say, well, this special file, please share with Alexandra, just to get your attention again. <laughs> 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 Or this special, uh, this special folder together with my KDE friends to work together on this document. And this is just sharing of data is so difficult. This is just, this is so difficult. People are mailing it around and, and this is horrible. That's what? It's painful. Yeah, great. Good morning. <laughs> okay, next is easy extent um, of storage. This is also a very interesting point. I mean, some, you're collecting all, more data all the time, more MP3s, more movies, more whatever, and it's growing and growing, and someday your hard disk is full. So what do you do? I mean, most people, they probably buy a bigger hard disk and install everything, complete operating system again, or, or removing data or whatever. This is really not good. It should be easy to say, well, I have this second device and this, this third server, so, server or whatever, and please, use this also to, for storing my data. So examples, what does this really mean in day-to-day in, in -day life? For example, I'm working on my thesis, right? I want to access this document from everywhere, from all devices, if I'm here in San Diego or in Germany, on my phone or whatever, I want to work on this all the time. But I don't, don't want to copy it around with USB, USB devices, and this just sucks because I, you lose them and they, they break, and this is not the best solution. Completely secure, still very important, and I want to have all my data versioned and backup, because, I mean, this is a lot of work. I don't want to lose the data. Next example is, I want my music accessible from everywhere. Um, even if it's too big to fit on my, on my, on my netbook. I, uh, sometimes I copy some folders around, but this is just, this is, not, this is not the best solution. And I want to share part of my music with a friend. So say, well, this folder or this artist or whatever, share this with this friend. Read only or read write or whatever. Next is, we do a KDE developer sprint and we're working on some documents. Yours, right? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, this is a use case where we use Google Docs now often, yeah. right? Wouldn't it be nice to have some, some solution where in a small group, share some folder and work together on some, some files, easy to set up without setting, having a server or whatever infrastructure, just say, well, I have here my, my personal cloud and share this folder with my friends. <laughs> 